Okay, or well, as we like to call it once again, TTEX, because we all like acronyms that make sense. Uh, I'm Merm, and Eric, How and Tyson, and we are going to talk about time-resolved extra diffraction. And so, if you look here carefully, we have a laser pumping in, lattice parameter going up and down, and we measure diffraction. So, that's what we do in the entire presentation. We'll go into the gory detail of this, and if you want to phase out right now and go to Facebook, you are free to do so. <laughs> why we do time resolved stuff. Everything happens fast. All processes happen at very fast time scales and it makes sense to be able to study them as they happen. And synchrotrons are the flash of experimentalist superheroes because they do processing extremely fast. And that's why we use them. So some speeding tickets for you here, a hummingbird flaps its wings 50 hertz, a good gamer can catch and while playing a first person shooter or something at 90 hertz going out, we speak at around three kilohertz and APS 24 bunch mode is at a 6.5 megahertz. Yeah, it's extremely fast in other words. Okay, wrong keyboard. So what do we do here? We make the world's most costliest thermometer. Uh, what happens is materials when they get heat up, they expand and that is why Back in India, when we make railroads, we, we keep large spaces because they literally expand during the summer, like six inches. And so what happens is if you can like calculate accurately what is the expansion, you can back out what was the temperature increase in the material. And that's exactly what we do. We, cal we put a laser probe in, we find out how much the lattice parameter has changed, and ergo calculate the temperature rise. Now, having said that, this is something that we did in three hours and that is not what the machine is intended for. We can do much better science here. And yeah, so that's something. So I'm gonna talk about the general experiment setup. The general idea is that you have a laser that you shine on your sample. This then heats up the sample and you can then use x-rays to probe the sample and look at the changes. And the image over here, you can kind of see the sample represented by the green your laser comes in, heats up the sample, then the x-rays probe it, and then the diffracted intensity can be measured with the detector. For your x-ray beam, you want it to be monochromatic, and you also want it to be focused, which is done with KB mirrors. And it's important to focus it because you only want to probe the area that's being heated up with the laser. Um, the sample we looked at was indium antimonide, and the assumption we make in our experiment is that the sample is uniformly heated in the pumped region. And what we're effectively doing is we, um, so we heat up the sample with a laser, laser, and then we measure it as it cools down. And the way we probe the structure is by looking at changes in 2 theta. So we can use this to calculate the temperature of the sample. And the particular peak we looked at in our sample was the 004 peak. So we looked at how the 2 theta had changed in this peak. And this image is stolen from some previous NXS school participants because we forgot to retrieve our data. And you can see there's two images here that are very close to each other, but you can see there's a slight shift in the Bragg peak, and that's because the sample temperature has changed and the despacing has correspondingly changed. So what we want to do is measure the time, um, the time part of this. So how we do that is by changing the delay between the pump and the probe. So sometimes you have the laser pump and then you probe straight afterwards, and sometimes you have a slight delay. These are all on very fast time scales though, nanoseconds I think we looked at. And this is only possible because of the pulse structure of the APS beam. So if it was a continuous beam, you wouldn't be able to do any of this experiment without some more complicated choppers or something. Um, so there's a range of different timescales we looked at in this experiment. So the laser pulse is super fast. It's 50 femtoseconds. And then the length of an X-ray bunch is 100 picoseconds. And the separation between the bunch is about 150 nanoseconds. So there's kind of three different timescales there. And the resolution of this technique is limited by the X-ray bunch bunch length, which is 100 picoseconds. So if you want to investigate processes that are faster than this, you can't do this on the APS, or not in this structure anyway, if you need to go to free electron lasers or something. Um, yeah, and I'll pass you over to Eric. Okay. So when we were getting our experiment set up, um, the next thing that we needed to do prior to collecting our data is figure out uh, where reflection was that we were going to take a look at. Um, but we knew that the uh, lattice parameter for um, this cubic structure, indium antimonide, it's about six and a half angstroms, so we can just do a little bit of math and figure out where 004 reflection is, which we just chose arbitrarily. 
Um, and then the next thing we need to do is figure out where that peak is absent any additional heating that we impart there, so for kind of for our control. Um, so that's all of the easy part. Uh, the, it gets slightly more difficult when you start needing to synchronize uh, when your pump ro arrives relative to your probe. So again, we're using this laser um, to pump some energy into the system, and you can tune that uh, laser energy basically for uh, the particular excitation you're looking uh, to study. And um, the part of this equation that we really can't control directly is the, uh, uh, the bunch mode of the um, electrons traveling around the ring. And so what we need to do is we need to adjust when we're delivering our pump relative to the probe. And uh, essentially, if you just take the time of the pump minus the time, sorry, the, when the pump arrives um, minus when the probe arrives, it should be um, a negative number. And the way you can kind of think about this is if you deliver the pump at the same time that the probe arrives, your sample really, really hasn't had time to respond to that yet. If the probe arrives too soon, um, then you won't actually see any change in your reflection because it hasn't been excited yet. Um, but after, if you uh, probe afterwards, then you should see some shift in your peak. And then we worked on generating this plot over here and essentially uh, played around with our delays in a little bit more of a, like a smaller uh, delay parameter space, I guess, if you will, uh, to look for the maximum response to our change in two theta as a result of the pulse. And um, we kind of saw this we kind of saw this shape of a curve here that had a well-defined maximum, and this is where you're seeing the maximum uh, response for, uh, from the laser pulse that you delivered. Okay, so the next part of this is actually collecting the diffraction pattern. Uh, how do you do that? Well, using an ultra-fast laser. A lot of these processes are very quick, um, and so the relaxation that you're going to see from this is uh, far faster than the time it takes to actually get this uh, pattern down here. So what you do is you actually alternate back and forth between the pump and the probe many, many times. So you excite your sample, um, and then you scan a very small range of, uh, a very small angle range, and you iterate back and forth between that many times in order to generate this full pattern here uh, and get yourself some good statistics. Um, and basically, yeah, that's how we collected our data. All right. So after the data, after the data collection, we can have a chance to do the data analysis first, that, uh, which needs a little bit of math, but only two questions, no worries. So in the start, there was a, uh, the equation that everybody knows, this is a Bragg law. So if, wanna, if we take a total uh, diffraction, a derivative, okay, a <laughs> derivative on the, on the two sides of the Bragg law, we can get an equation like this one, where delta D is the angular position of the uh, Bragg peak before and after the laser radiation. And the data data is what we picked. We picked the four uh, angles for this uh, process. And then once we got this one, we can uh, determine the temperature increase at each uh, time delay we choose. So when the sample is heated by the laser, by the pump, uh, it will spill, right? So it can cause a strain. Uh, but because of the uh, constraint of the sample geometry, it can only spill in the direction of the out of the plane, which is basically the uh, perpendicular to the interface of the thin film. So we can use Poisson ratio, Poisson ratio to relate the constraint, which is actually delta D over D, with the temperature increase at a different time delay. So by a very easy arrange, not rearrangement, you can get this equation. Here is the delta D as the uh, temperature or decrease or increase change uh, at a different uh, uh, strength. And then by doing that, we, let's look at uh, the data we collected. So here is the uh, two parameters we picked from the uh, uh, what's uh, tech or the, the instrument. There's a data. So here's, this one is a reference angle. We picked the four angles for the different time delays. This is a time delay we picked. And then by uh, using these two parameters, we, we can calculate the D space using Bragg law, the data data, and uh, the strength is actually what I showed you before. And then this is a data T. By using this equation, we can get a delta T here. Delta T is the um, temperature different temperature change over different uh, time uh, delays. So if you want to plot the time delayed with the temperature change, you can get a sense of how fast or how slow this process happens, or how fast the temperature uh, decreases. In this case, you can see it happens in a microsecond of time scale. Uh, that's pretty uh, neat because if you, if you uh, use the model to feed this data, you can have a, a chance to uh, figure out what is the interfacial 
uh, thermal conductance of your thin film at the interface. So it's um, that's a neat technique. So basically, in conclusion, we want to say that uh, time resolved S ray is a, uh, a very good, a powerful technique to study or measure the time uh, temperature revo uh, evolution before and after the laser radiation. And uh, so if you understand that this study, we can also, as I said, we can study the uh, uh, interfacial conductance of the thin film, right? And the uh, last one is we, uh, what we studied that, uh, uh, is a process that happened in the time scale of a microsecond. If you want to go shorter time scale as possible, so LCL LCLS has already demonstrated that, that uh, there's a pulse duration of 50 photoseconds. So basically it is very uh, powerful and a neat technique. Uh, for a lot of uh, research, so if you want to make a proposal, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm not a film scientist. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I guess uh, that's what we want to deliver to you guys. And uh, last, we want to uh, acknowledge Anthony. Anthony is a film scientist. I contact him if you want to do it. And uh, SS Score, thanks so much. And also Agong and Alcor National Lab. Thanks, we're kind of open to questions. <laughs> this fast what we like yeah so the two ups and downs are the intensity how how intense it can measure and how uh, uh, resolved it is in delta e but i think we can do it this fast at this point and you do want to select a peak um, when you're figuring out which peak to watch uh, you know kind of move around move to i guess lower uh, angle you want to select a peak that's fairly intense um, just to make your life a little bit easier when you get to actually looking at the data and, yeah. and that. Could, could you measure thermal conductivity of these detectors on the Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how the temperature evolves, yeah. and if you know the, your system geometry, is you can do a simple mathematical model that yeah, yeah, gives yeah. you thermal, so your heat flow through your model, and you can back out thermal conductivity if you can measure your yeah. temperature evolution. Yeah. Yes. What if when you have the You won't see the effect of the thermal You won't get the effect of the pulse. That's the, so. And these are localized effects. So what we are assuming is that your system responses only to that pulse. So if anything is far out from it, it practically doesn't see it. Yeah. And is these are very mild pulses. So we are like one millijoule per centimeter square. So it's like very mild pulses. So yeah. he does not know if I am getting it by a pulse, basically. I've heard of experiments where they do shock waves, take a silicon yeah. wafer, and get one side and measure the back side. Right. No, the, yeah, shock that, that shock will waves happen. will propagate through yeah. your material. Yeah. Uh, I don't think heat yeah. will do. And once again, these are very mild pulses. Yeah. yeah. What are most of the kinds of research that's done with this beam line? Do you know? They, uh, they do map, um, I think they did some phonon mapping on this one. Was he telling us about they that? do Something lattice like dynamics. That. Lattice, that, yeah. Phonon dynamics, yeah. they do. Photo, you can do a lot of photocatalysis on this. Photocatalysis, yeah, photosynthesis. Pulse probe things, that is something that yeah. you can do. And like this, which we latently stole from Professor Lin Chen. So this gives us kind of a map of the time scales that we are looking at and what can be studied so in principle. Want, then your sample just has to be bigger than the laser. Yeah. 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 You, you also need crystal si crystallite sizes that are large enough to have narrow peaks so that uh, you can actually detect you know, how, they're, how much they're moving. If you have big, broad, fat peaks, it's going to be really difficult to resolve any changes. Other questions? Okay, thanks. All right, thank you.